All right, everyone. Uh, we're going to begin our interoperability in a decentralized world panel, and we have Ben Jones as our moderator. What's up, guys? How's it going? Woo! This has been a really like awesome two days. Like this has been really awesome. So let's hope we, we're going to finish strong here. So I, we've got an, an awesome set of panelists here um, that are going to be talking today. Um, but sort of in prep for this, we thought we'd ask the audience a question first, actually, uh, which is how many people have heard of or used a cryptocurrency exchange? Okay, good, good, that sounds right. How about uh, one called Shapeshift? Okay. Now who's heard of uh, an atomic swap? Yeah. Wow, all right, all right, so that's a good, that's a good framing. Um, so I think we'll get back to that and be talking about all those things uh, in just a second, um, but I'd love to give the, the panelists a chance to introduce themselves first, so why don't we start with Evan? This on? Is this on? Yes. Um, hello, I'm Evan Schwartz. I am the co-inventor of the Interledger Protocol, which is a protocol for doing payments across any type of payment system, blockchain or not. Uh, my name is Jared Tate. Uh, my story started in 2012 when I discovered Bitcoin, as I'm sure many of the people in this room today did. And uh, that was the beginning of my rabbit hole experience. Uh, which in 2013, after going through the core protocol, I saw some issues, thought we could improve some things, and that led to the creation of Digibyte on January 10th, 2014. And I've spent the last, uh, going on five years now, um, developing and implementing new things to scale and improve the efficiency of the Digibyte blockchain. And a lot of the stuff that we've pioneered is now used in dozens of other blockchains. Okay, hello, yes. Uh, my name is Paul Stortz. Uh, I invented something called DriveChain, which is a decentralized sidechains uh, system for Bitcoin. Uh, you can uh, find, on, there's a project site, drivechain.info, that has a, a ridiculous amount of information, especially the FAQ, uh, which is great. And that is, uh, there's a GitHub and the project's basically finished, so this is a, this is a sidechains uh, concept. So that's the idea of taking your uh, Bitcoin token, your BTC, and, and putting it on these things that are pretending to be other blockchains. So you can put it onto like a fake Litecoin and get 2.5 minute blocks, or you can put it onto Ethereum and do weird Ethereum contracts. Uh, so that's it's pretty interoperable. Yeah, so I think it's funny actually that we started with Evan saying that he has something called Interledger that works with things that aren't even blockchains, right? And then we go over to, to Paul on the other side of the spectrum, only wants to use Bitcoin, right? Which is really funny that sort of what the things that you build are gonna represent Bitcoin, right? The original like 21 million. I guess the question there really is, what is interoperability? What counts as something being blockchain interoperability versus just sort of two blockchains that are being used or being talked about in the same room or, you know? Where, where do you guys draw that line? Well, yeah, we did. Um, so, yeah, well, obviously we have to talk about this because what is the panel about? I mean, it's about interoperability, but what is that? And there's, I think there's a contrast between probably, I don't know how many people here even are uh, the right age to even know anything about any of this, but there are these old hardware routers that were multi-protocol, and that was, that's one way of looking at something being interoperable or, or you can like imagine exporting something to comma separated values or something and then re-importing it somewhere else. But I think what these blockchains do is they transfer value and uh, even a smart contract kind of transfers value in exchange for something else, X. And so I think w to me what it's all about is just you're trying to send $20 from A to B and you don't care exactly what it goes what kinds of weird stuff it may go through or what you may end up receiving as long as it can buy, it has like 20 minutes of persuasive force. You can get like a hamburger and fries out of it or something at the end of the system. I, I like to separate into, I think there's roughly three types of interoperability that we could talk about. So one of them is value exchange. So that's I have Bitcoin and you have Ether and I wanna send value to you. So it needs to be traded in the middle of that. That would be one. Another one would be kind of representing one asset on a different ledger. So that's like I have 10 Bitcoin over here and I would like those 10 Bitcoin to be to pop up and be ex kind of movable on a different ledger. So that's some, that's a certain type of interoperability. And then I think a third one would be 
Like, if you could write smart contracts or some kind of logic that can interact with different systems. I think that would be, would be another type, and I think there's other types that we could probably talk about, but my guess is we're mostly gonna talk about the first two. Yeah, to me, interoperability is pretty simple. So, like in the case of Digibyte, you know, we can currently handle 560 transactions per second, right? Which is about 80 times faster than Bitcoin. But there's still one problem. There is no one single blockchain out there that can scale to handle every single thing that everybody in the world wants to put on a blockchain, whether it's assets, whether it's property, whether it's data. There's just no one single blockchain that can scale to do that. So in order to have a, vi a viable future, there needs to be some mechanism for Bitcoin, Ethereum, Vertcoin, you know, Dogecoin, whatever, you, whatever blockchain you're looking at to be able to transfer value so the entire ecosystem can scale in the long term. Right, we have seen uh, the world change a lot from there being only Bitcoin to being many, many, many projects, and I think that has attracted a lot of interest in this topic because there's now so many different projects that it's, people are interested in what, which project is going to win or will all the projects stick around and cooperate and how will they do that and will there be a big upset where some will do that and others will be outcompeted or something like that. So I think that is what drives, I think that's why this is a really, really important um, topic right now. So that, so that certainly seems um, like a very interesting perspective as almost interoperability is like a scalability solution is, is I think what I'm hearing. Um, what are the trade-offs that come with that? Does it, is, is that a less secure system if we're in a world where instead of one blockchain to rule them all, there's a million? Um, is that a bad thing or a good thing? Somewhere in between. I think it's inevitable. Um, there, there are different design choices that go into building ledgers, computer programming languages, databases, and any type of system. And I don't think it's about finding the best technology that's going to serve all use cases. I think there's, there's just different trade-offs. Like if you're making a system where you need everything to be super, super fast, you may be willing to trade, and you're doing like small amounts, you may be willing to trade off some amount of security versus if you're doing very infrequent, super high value transfers. And it's not necessary, I don't think that there's one system that would serve both of those because like, you just have different trade-offs there. Yeah, I think it goes back to the scalability problem. Uh, you know, from my perspective, there's one major issue in the entire industry right now, and that's the reliance on centralized exchange points. So to me, the first, you know, real-world examples of interoperability in a pure technical 100% blockchain manifestation are decentralized exchanges. And there's actually working use cases out there right now, um, two of which you can check out, um, like the Blocknet and uh, Barterdex using atomic swaps. You literally can go and trade Bitcoin to um, Litecoin, Litecoin to Digibyte in a true decentralized fashion you know, with interoperability. So I think the first iteration of interoperability that we'll see you know, become more mainstream as time goes on is in the decentralized exchange area. I think, um, I think interoperability is kind of like you're cooperating versus competing, where you are competing on the technology, but you're cooperating in some sense where you're agreeing to honor something about the other system's uh, decisions or uh, features. And so I think it's going to be very difficult. It's like what you were saying before, Jared, where you were saying uh, that there, people want so many different things, and the blockchain is kind of like very, it's very communist in a way. It's kind of funny where there's this one commons, this block space, that everyone has to validate the, the chain, and it's the exact same chain for everyone. So everyone's trapped in this one-size-fits-all thing. So if there's no interoperability, I don't see that being viable long term because there's just so many people in the world and they're all very different from each other and some of them want things to be usable or cheap and uh, other people have access to a fast internet connection or cheap hardware. They don't mind if the node is more expensive to run. So there's all these, some people are more experimental and other people are more conservative. So I think that is uh, the security aspect is that there will be all these different trade-offs that will be different for each person. And so today, it's, we don't see one-size-fits-all security at all. There's banks that have 
one level, there's the government, the NSA, they have one level, and then there's Facebook, that's a different level, and then there's your grandmother who has no idea what she's doing kind of level, so I don't I think that's a big aspect. So, so yeah, building on that, along those lines of sort of um, usability and use cases, um, and I guess also touching on scalability, um, we have things like the Lightning Network coming about. Um, and that's often touted as a, as a scalability solution, but I think there are implications to interoperability too. Maybe you guys could touch on that. Well, the, the one thing I wanted to touch on as I was just kind of overhearing this is there's also this term out there called being chain agnostic, right? Which I think a lot of people are, are kind of intertwining with interoperability. And the premise being when you build a blockchain platform, whether it's to you know, put property, real estate assets, et cetera, you make it chain agnostic so if one chain goes down, you can actually you know, potentially anchor the data in multiple chains. Um, and, and I actually think that's another form of scalability in, in, in that sense. Um, just wanted to point that out there. So, so Paul, would that be similar to something like drive chain or these sort of side chain implementations? Uh, yeah, uh, well, yeah, we mix a lot of things together here, but drive chain, so it's interesting, like the way the Lightning Network is designed, just to speak fast and loose to a first, first approximation, uh, it's like a lot of the stuff in Lightning is designed never to be used because it's just supposed to be, you do something on chain and then a bunch of stuff happens off chain that you never need the blockchain to do any validation or ha inter have any interaction with at all. And then if all goes well, then a second thing happens on chain. And both of those things could kind of happen today. And so, but it, that's insufficient. There's a, the reason that people do so much work on Lightning is because they need to make sure that what happens when the chain isn't looking um, will punish anyone who who misbehaves or tries to breach the contract. So Lightning is sort of designed not to be used, and drive chain is kind of the s same, where it's supposed to establish this one-to-one -one peg in to and out of uh, side chains or uh, altcoins or something like that. But it, it, I would don't imagine people actually using it. I instead imagine people using these uh, atomic swaps or the Lightning Network to just travel through them uh, very quickly. So it's a little bit like signing a contract and taking it to court where you, you don't often, uh, you don't often, like, uh, if you sign, uh, you almost never take someone to court to get a contract enforced. You just, since both of you know that that's, it's going to be enforced eventually, you just kind of both uh, fulfill it or honestly fulfill it. But yeah, we're mixing a lot of different uh, things together. Um, you all probably know about what the Lightning Network is and what, almost everyone raised their hand for atomic swaps, even though we don't really see them being used right now. But I think, weren't we pitching, I think we're pitching, weren't we fit, uh, softball to Evan for the atomic swaps uh, line here? Because Evan has said something really interesting when we had the pre-panel uh, talk. So Evan, why don't you, I don't know, take it away. I, All right, so I, six months ago, I would have described Interledger as just a protocol for coordinating atomic swaps across lots of different types of ledgers. And then we decided that atomic swaps are actually quite bad for payments. Um, and there's... A, um, intake of breath. Um, the, there's kind of a key part with atomic swaps that not a lot of people think about, but I think is a really, really big problem, specifically when it's being used for payments. So if you're using it in a like, I'm trading directly with you just to, to like transfer some assets back to me, like I want, you know, I have Bitcoin and I want to get Ether or something like that, that could work. But if you're talking about it for payments, so you, you brought up the example earlier of like, if I want to make, if I want to do a real, have a realistic payment experience using blockchain technology, the issue today is like everybody's on their different current, has their different currency and is on their different system. So if I want to have any kind of payment experience, I need some way to do like a multi-hop transfer to you so that I send it as Bitcoin and it arrives in your account as whatever you want without us having to think about it. So that's the payment experience I'm talking about. So now why are atomic swaps bad for that? What it has to do with is the, the time part. So atomic swaps or hash time lock contracts, which is the most common way of setting them up, um, have two parts to them. The hash lock part and the timeout part. And most people focus on the hash lock part, but it's actually the time that gets you. So like real quick, or actually, how many people are familiar with the workings of hash time lock contracts? Not so many. Okay, I'm gonna go through it real quick. Sorry for the, those who, who do know it. So the idea is, 
I wanna send value over to Paul and it's gonna go through this chain. So what I'm going to do is, I'm, let's say we're both on Ethereum and you two are, we're both on Digibyte and you two are both on, on Bitcoin. And so I'm going to lock up some, basically escrow some funds on Digibyte, waiting for the pre-image of a hash to be presented and then he's going to take that in. So he knows that if he can present the pre-image of that hash, he will get that money. He doesn't have to trust me. He just has to trust Digibyte, which he already does. So that's no problem. So now he takes that. That's basically as good as money to him. And then he goes and puts money also in S um, on the Bitcoin blockchain for Paul. Now, at this point, no money has actually been transferred. But then Paul basically present, he knows the pre-image of that hash that it was set up with. Right, all right, so we get, we get a random number R, and whenever we shout R, all this stuff's gonna go through. Yeah. And so, so he knows, he makes R, and then we lock this other thing up with H right. or whatever, and then he passes me a note as R, and I know what it is. So then I shout it out, and then we all shout it out, and then all the money goes through, sort of. But yeah. So, continue. yeah, so then he, he basically presents the pre-image of this hash to claim the funds. And so he presents it, the Bitcoin blockchain transfers the funds to him, and then as the intermediary, he can pass the blockchain, uh, pass the, the pre-image over to Digibyte, and then Digibyte will transfer it. So that's an atomic swap. Sorry, we don't have like better gra or like graphics to explain it. I hope that was a little bit clear. So now the, the issue there, so that hash lock part is the idea that I'm escrowing funds with some hash, and there's also a timeout, because the problem is, if I lock up my funds over here, and he just doesn't do anything, I don't want it to get stuck forever. Like at some point, I need to, it needs to be like, okay, this is not happening, I get my money back. Now, in most atomic swap protocols, in, um, you need that timeout to be quite long because you need to be able to account for like, what if the blockchain is really congested? So he needs to be able, to, that timeout basically represents Past this point in time, I get my money back. And so even if he submitted the pre-image of the hash, after that time, it wouldn't matter. I would be able to claim my money and get it back. Because I wanna make sure that like, you know, if this doesn't happen today, I get my money back. The problem is that for the intermediary, he has to basically lock in an exchange rate for the full duration of that swap. And so the reason why that's a problem is, think of the volatility of cryptocurrencies. Now imagine I came to you and I said, I want to buy some cryptocurrency, but I wanna give me a price that I can, I can use, accept, use this price or, or take this option at any point in the next 24 hours. How would you, what price would you put on Bitcoin to Ether for 24 hours? It's really crazy. So, he basically has to lock in that exchange rate, and the bad thing that can happen, so I'm going on kind of long, but just to finish up, the bad thing that can happen is that I, can, I put my funds on hold, he puts his funds on hold, and then Paul just waits. Paul just waits 24 hours to see R, if the exchange rate him. moves in his favor. And if the exchange rate moves in his favor, then he accepts it at the very last moment, getting a much, much better exchange rate and kind of screwing him. Yeah, I'm gonna get the best rate and he's gonna get the worst rate. Exactly, and so that's like a, a big problem with atomic swaps is that you have this very long timeout that comes from needing to have the blockchain as this arbiter in there. Um, and this is something that I think more people should be talking about. End of rant. Yes, because the Lightning Network is, um, is, is it, it, it will work across all these different blockchains as long as they have the same hash function, which they all will. So, it, so that's kind of neat, but the, what Evan's pointing out is that it really won't because every, all the people who are in the middle, they are de facto exchange, but it's an exchange where you can cancel. There's a reason why if you buy, um, I think if you buy like Bitcoin on Coinbase and you don't use a credit card or something, if you use a bank, you cannot cancel it. And there's a reason, which is that if you could cancel it, nothing would ever get done because people would buy it and then they would, if the price went down, they would just cancel it and then rebuy it. And so the, you can't have that. You have to have some finality in altcoin exchange. But it is interesting that in the world of side chains, the kind of what I have in mind with drive chain is that there would be this peg system, as I explained, just sort of like a court with, that people really wouldn't use, but since that would establish this precedent that, okay, the price is really not going to change, so there's really not going to be 
large price movements or maybe maybe even any price movements within 24 hours. So in that I, case, I it would that, work. What that gets you is the ability, that's, I, I would put that in the category of like, that's less about uh, exchanging value and more like, I want to represent my Bitcoin on a different ledger that may have different properties that I'm, I may want. So that's kind of the, I'm like, tr I don't know what a good way to describe this is, mm. but sort of yes, transferring the, the asset to a different ledger for some, for some amount of time. It's, it's the absolute idea, but I think because drive chain is intentionally very slow for uh, security reasons that the, there would be a preference for one over the other. So I think there would be like a 0.999 to one peg in practice because you can go in one direction almost instantly, but going from the side chain back to the main chain is, is sort of slightly slow. Just, and so I think it's just a little bit more inconvenient. But the cool thing is that there's no reason to expect that exchange rate even though it's not one to one, it would be one to 0 0.99. There's no reason to expect it to change, and so I, I, you wouldn't have this problem that everyone is talking about. Well, I, if that I also, makes any sense, maybe we just confused everyone. I don't know. Well, I also see it as being a function of like how fast a particular blockchain is, right? So in the case of Bitcoin, you're locking up. You're going to have to wait for confirmations. You potentially take an hours. Whereas you're talking something like Digibyte with 15 second blocks, Ethereum, you know, 15, 17 second blocks. You have the ability to do this multi hop much quicker than you would with others. So I think that yeah. factors into it too. Definitely, so the, the amount of time definitely matters, although I think there's actually one, one further thing which is the variance in the time can also be a big issue because even if you have 15 second blocks, that means like when, it's, when the system is working well, I can get it in really quick. But what if someone is intentionally trying to clog up the blockchain with a bunch of crap to prevent me from getting it in? They're one of the reasons why you have like if you're doing this with Bitcoin, even though you may only need like 10 minutes or an hour worth of confirmations to do things securely, the reason why you want it to be more like a day is it's, it's unlikely that someone would be able to clog it up for a whole day. Um, and so I think even if the time is kind of short, you still need that safety window. And that, that's one of the big issues I see with the, yeah, with the atomic swap thing is like you, you always need a fairly long amount of time in order to, just for, just for security purposes. So would you agree with the statement that as long as you're doing just, you know, a one way, one person to one person and not multi-hop, that atomic swaps are viable? Like in the I, case of decentralized exchanges, if it's, you know, party A to party B and there's no party intermediary? I think that what, what makes it, be, what makes them a little bit more viable in that scenario is that um, you know, like the sender is also the receiver in a way. Like if it's going from me right. to you back to me, then I like want to, to use this. And so the problem for the sender in a multi, in a multi hop thing is that I don't actually really have control over whether this works. So I think it may be a little bit better, although um, you still need a mechanism to prevent the, some party from just putting the funds on hold and then not accepting it for a long while. But that's easier to do in a kind of one-to-one -one system. Right? Yes, the atomic swap could be very, very, very fast. So it could be like I pick random number R and then I make H, which is hash of R, and then I say, okay, I'll give you four Litecoin, only if, some, only if you know what R is, though. But here's the H. And then you say, okay, and then you say, fine, since it's already locked to so this H, he reuses the same H and he says, well, I'll give you, you know, whatever, 13 Ethereum or 100 Ripple or something, locked to the same H. And then I either say R or I don't. And it's, it is a similar problem where I can just wait and see, do I get a more favorable rate um, or not? But, you know, it's, it's so fast that the whole, the whole thing could be negotiated in like 10 seconds and then the timeouts would maybe be very, very fast as well. So. At a certain point, I would just be like, do I want to play games all day or do I want to just do what I came here to do, which is trade Litecoin for Ripple or whatever? So, so would I be right in uh, thinking that this atomic swap problem is like front running? Is that, is that a term that people use? Well, that's kind of what we're talking about. It's sort of like, um, it's not so much front running, it's like um, it's a free, back it's a running free or option. something. <laughs> it, it's so it's, it's not front running, but it's taking advantage of a free option, is that when I'm an intermediary in an atomic swap, I'm basically giving an option to buy currency at a certain price up until a certain time. It's kind and of, you're kind of guaranteeing that you will be front run. This is sort of weird. Front running more describes like if you have an exchange and there's different people placing orders that of course you can it's not, get, no, get I mean, one it, in. I agree it's not technically front running, but it's the same like effect. It's like it's very similar. Just, someone is a loser. <laughs>
I think it's it's important to note here that the, the problem with like a decentralized exchange is just simple market discovery. Like what price should be people be setting the buy and sell for these things at? You know, who determines that if it's actually decentralized? So that is that is one of the problems that still has to be worked out. So it's better better with side chains because it's all it's all one to one or one to point nine 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 as I was saying. So you don't have to worry about that. But that it is a problem the way it is now. Um, so Evan, does Interledger um, share this problem? I, I know Interledger is sort of separate from Lightning, but maybe connected. Maybe you could talk to that a little. Yeah, so as I said, we, we were doing atomic swaps and then took them out. And so what we replaced them with, I call it hash time lock agreement, which is different than a contract. So um, the way it works is we kind of saw this problem, looked at a variety of different ways of approaching it, and decided that in order to reduce this problem in a multi-hop scenario, you need to make the timeouts very, very short. So we want the timeout to be on the order of 10 to 30 seconds, which means that you can't have the blockchain as an arbiter at all because there's no time for, like, if something goes wrong in those 10 seconds, there's no way to, like, go say, hey, blockchain, like, this guy tried to screw me. So we kind of have a different setup. And um, the, the setup is similar to what I described before, but without the blockchain ensuring anything. Um, I can walk through... That flow, if if that's of interest. I don't know. Yeah, I also I want to make sure we have time to get questions from the audience as well. So maybe it would be a good time to start um, lining up for that. If you guys have questions for the panelists, um, I I do think that this sort of model of liquidity is bandwidth that you talked about in your talk earlier today is very very fascinating, Evan. Um, so yeah. So the, generally, the interledger approach is just you do it super fast and with relatively small amounts. So the free option is there, but it's like an option to buy a tiny bit of currency for a tiny amount of time. So it's not really a problem. Um, and so we think of money as bandwidth, which separate topic, but yeah. Fascinating. Okay. Um, well, do we have any uh, audience questions? I think I saw you there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's a. Uh... Question for everybody, but I think Paul, uh, I read you know some of the material about drive chains, uh, and then I've been playing with Lightning a little bit. So the the principles are all there. And then I hear everybody in the space talking about the same things. Um, but is I don't know if you can elaborate, but um, is opening and closing a payment channel on Lightning pretty much like um, building new blocks onto a side chain in a sense? Uh, I think they are similar, where you are um, you're suspending some money in something new. So you could think of, I think actually it's, uh, you, you can imagine a Lightning Network hub, so to speak. Like it's, Lightning Network is a little more economically efficient in hubs, if you ask me. So it could be a little bit more like, like banks, but strongly, that is like frequently misrepresented to slander the Lightning Network, which is what I don't intend to do, but the, I would imagine that it would be easier if there was a more hub-and-spoke type of Lightning model where you'd have, you, you'd go into with one big hub and you'd have all these people connected to you and then those hubs would be connected to other hubs. Maybe this is just confusing everyone, but I think the idea of a, a hub that has lots of different channels connected to it, I think that is really, really uh, anal uh, analogous or analogous? How's that word pronounced? I don't know. But whatever it is, um, that's similar to uh, having a side chain because someone can deposit, they can peg in or go main to side with these transfers and then their money is in the same kind of pool as everyone else's. So I think that uh, Lightning Network Hub and a side chain are very similar. I guess just kind of a larger theme here yeah. in that I see a lot of people Trying, uh, working on projects that seem to be doing similar things. And I'm wondering if, does Lightning Network, because I know you have like those two BIPs uh, on there and I was reading through them and you kind of need that to be uh, signaled by enough nodes for it to be actually be implemented in a Bitcoin core, but does Lightning, let, does Lightning Network let you do side chains a little bit on like a, on like a layer two kind of uh, level? No, or? it doesn't. So oh. it's uh, Lightning, let's, the Lightning Network is really awesome. Um, it lets you do anything that can be done on chain can be done on the Lightning Network, but it doesn't go the other way around. And that's what side chains try to do is they say, well, here's what you can do on the main chain, and then you can do different things if you want, uh, slightly different security. But uh, with Lightning, the advantage is there's absolutely, it's totally ironclad. There's no, um, there's no human reactivity uh, or kind of any kind of game theory or interaction at all, or any kind of investment feedback at all. Whereas with sidechains, there's this very, very, very slow thing that's intentionally to create 
a, a very tiny little loop powered by human feedback or just powered by just uh, an, in, an investor uh, loss of confidence in the, the side chain or the main chain. So. Thanks. Okay, yeah, I think next up uh, on this side. Hi, yeah, so I had a question about uh, the interledger protocol. You talk about how bandwidth is essentially analogous to how much money you have or how much credit you have. And I feel like that raises some privacy concerns with regards to essentially being able to identify very easily who has how much. Yeah, good question. So um, the reason we think about, there's a couple reasons why we think about money as bandwidth. And it's basically like, if I'm an intermediary in a system like Interledger or, or in Lightning as well, um, my limit is how much money I have. So if you, I'm trying to forward payments for you, um, that's limited by how much capital, working capital I have. Now the reason to think about it as bandwidth is that if you come to me and you say, oh, I want to do a huge volume of payments right now, effectively what that may do is lock up a bunch of my money in payments meant for you. And so you could kind of take advantage of that to make it so that when someone else comes to me and wants to make payments, I'm unable to because I don't have any more money to facilitate their payments. So you need to think about the working capital that you have as bandwidth. And it's actually, funny enough, it's, it's actually very similar to like internet routers have a certain amount of bandwidth that they can route uh, and need to allocate it to different parties so that one user can't just use up the entire ISP's bandwidth. So that's kind of, in a nutshell, why you think of it as bandwidth. And then the other question about privacy. So um, Interledger is built much more in a hub and spoke model than something like Lightning, I think, is going for. And the idea there is there are, like, um, most people don't have that much money. That is un unfortunately true. And so if, you're, if you want nodes that are going, if you want to create competition, but basically the idea with Interledger is to create a lot of competition between the nodes. So if there are big, hu big hubs that can process lots of payments, that's okay. As long as it's a competitive system. So if they try to charge super high fees, then you just route around them. Um, but it's, it's not a problem if you know who the hubs are. Per se. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. So my question is, if a if a blockchain, let's say Ethereum, can solve the scalability problem, meaning that we can have many transactions per second, and we can also handle large computations, and so we can have a fully decentralized uh, exchange on Ethereum. So what's the number one reason that interoperability is important? Have you met Bitcoiners before? <laughs> I'm mean, saying that kind of in a joke, but like, um, um, the, in, in all honesty, like I think even if you had a system that was very scalable and could do a lot of fancy stuff, I think you would have other people that would say, this is one of those trade-offs, is how, much, how many features are there? So for one application, you may want there to be a lot of features, but that's also a much bigger attack surface. I may want a system where it doesn't do a lot. I don't want my, you know, I want my blockchain to be very tailored to one specific use case, and I, more features is actually a bad thing. Um, and so I think that's just another trade-off that you make in terms of how many features does it support, and do you want a Turing complete blockchain, uh, Turing complete language in your blockchain? Some people would say definitely yes, and other people would say definitely no. And I don't think you'll ever get those people to agree. No, absolutely. I mean, even on narrowly considered only on scalability, you could, you, if you had scalability as like miles per gallon of a car or something, uh, even if you had a car that was very, very, very fuel efficient, it could go a million miles per gallon, you would have peop some people want to buy a car that has a large gas tank and other people just want a car that has a small gas tank. So obviously if you had some kind of infinite uh, miles per gallon, it would not be uh, an important consideration, but that's not going to happen. So you... Even if something's very scalable, you will have, in a population of six billion people, there will be disagreements over what is appropriate. To, to kind of summarize this for the audience, there's this term out there, you know, you're talking about Ethereum, the virtual machine model, versus the rigidity in the secure UTXO model that doesn't allow for as many, I guess, flexibilities. But there's also this proven model that's been around for almost a decade now 
that doesn't have a lot of the issues. And you know, going back to Ethereum specifically, there's no way that every ICO and startup out there is going to scale their business commercially on top of Ethereum. It's just, I mean, look what CryptoKitties did, right? It brought it to a halt right away. So there needs to be this interoperability. And there are scalable UTXO solutions out there as well, too. So, uh, so you're thinking that no, none of these networks are going to be in that level of scalability in any time. Like, no, that, but that's, that's not the point. Bet, right? No, it's I not the point. It has nothing yeah. to do with... Uh, like, it's the one-size-fits-all that we're talking about. Yeah, no, no, like your, yeah I, I got your answer. I, I agree. Uh, but, I, I'm, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't think we're looking at a, a winner-take-all scenario here. It just, it just technologically can't happen. Cool. Uh, on the side, maybe, next? Hi, yeah. Um, I, I'm the guy willing to ask a, a stupid question. Um, but I, I'm kind of curious from a general standpoint, this, this, uh, the volatility being a problem uh, for the interoperability, but I'm wondering, once these problems with interoperability get, get kind of solved in whatever way they do, do you guys think it will contribute to stability uh, in general, so there's less volatility, there's just more kind of cooperative uh, you know, efforts because there's everyone's so linked together. That's just oh, a general question, that, you know. No, absolutely. There's because you don't you have to have something to fight over. And right now, there's the one is we have a one size fits all world, and so you have a reason to harass someone, which is to get revenge on them for not putting your thing in or whatever. And so, but before, but in, a, in an interoperable world, you just start up your own new thing and plug it in, and then it's, everyone's cooperating, I think. So I think absolutely. I, you were saying more tranquility among, as far as the people who are interacting, right? So I, that's absolutely yes. Which kind of fundamentally resembles how the internet itself works, you know, in its current format with various corporations and organizations sharing access and, you know. I actually don't think that interoperability will, will necessarily affect the stability of exchange rates because basically you, with cryptocurrencies, you have free floating act, uh, exchange rates that are not managed by like a central bank, for example. And so I think you will probably always have like some amount of speculation on them, um, potentially driven by people deliberately trying to move the market uh, for their benefit, um, things like that. So I, I would expect fairly volatile exchange rates, maybe until, like if there are services that are priced in cryptocurrencies, um, then the value of that service may make it a little bit more stable over time. But I think as long as they're kind of uh, largely driven by, or a lot of the price movements are driven by speculation and it's not managed, then I think you'll see pretty wild exchange rates. Cool. Yeah. Sounds like we've got time for just one more quick question. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Arthur from Liquidity Network. Thank you so much for this panel. It's very interesting. Um, I have one little comment on the um, Lightning Hubs. So um, I actually don't believe that the Lightning Hub is efficient because each individual channel, uh, you would need to manage collateral uh, for each particular channel and you can only swip, swap this collateral with an on-chain transaction, which is very expensive. So you wouldn't be able to manage the, the collateral in bulk. But the question I have to you is um, on the security side, because everybody is saying, good, I have this new chain and has so many transactions per second. And I think in interoperability, it's important to quantify the security. So for example, how many blocks do I need to wait in Ethereum to have the same security in Bitcoin, like for six Bitcoin blocks? Or if you have your blockchain X, how long do I need to wait for a transaction to clear in order to have the same security in another blockchain. So if we're talking about interoperability, do you think maybe of like a standard to quantify security of a transaction? So in, in the interledger model, the way we think about this is you trust whatever ledgers you want um, and you shouldn't have to understand or think about the security of any other system. And the whole idea is that you should be able to make a payment to anybody in the world, even if they're on some crappy system that you don't trust at all. When they say they've gotten paid, that's good enough to you because that means they'll give you the service that you want. And so the whole model is about kind of localizing the 
the security or the, or the risk so that like if I'm paying you through some series of hops and you happen to be on like a really good ledger or a really bad ledger, it doesn't affect me at all. And the only thing that I have to trust is like the systems that I'm directly connected to. Awesome. All right, I think we're out of time, so how about a round of applause for our panelists? <laughs>